uh, ask. I will now uh, pass you over to Monsignor Hand and ask him to give us his reflection and his blessing. Father. Well, I'll spend some time walking with Jesus, not as a history lesson, but as disciples who now share the new life promised by Jesus. I sit here roughly two thirds of a mile away from St. Columbus Hospice, about a mile away from perhaps a lesser known place, Ferryfield, which is a national health uh, facility along Ferry Road, which also caters for very chronically sick uh, people somewhere in between hospital and in between uh, a nursing home. We come to be disciples, reflecting on that sense of Jesus as he takes us this way of the cross. We are disciples, not walking a history lesson, but sharing in the new life promised uh, by Jesus, that new life that the Gospel of John shows flowering on the cross, that Jesus through loving sacrifice is victorious. And what we are doing tonight is walking that, sharing that, not pretending it's something in the past because it is something in the present and of the future, that we share in that through living his love now. Suppose I could be a bit abstract for somebody lying in pain in a hospice bed or a hospital bed or at home, being cared for hopefully by loved ones. But yet that's the root of why that woman or man says, I will go on living. Because life is a gift to be cherished, even though I suffer in doing so. But also it may say, say, yes, I will suffer that, but I am willing to let go. Even though in a way I want to cling to life, but I'm also ready to let go of that gift of life, when it's no longer possible to continue, when the time has come to slip the moorings. It's my destiny to go into the mysterious beyond what I call heaven. And Jesus shared that with us on the cross, that gift of life now and of life to come. That is who Jesus is, the sharer of life. That's what he does and did in the heart of the Father. He's doing the Father's will and bringing humanity and creation to their destiny. And that's something we have, I think, to hold on to in anything we see about the end of life. And that's not saying that we don't or shouldn't feel pain. And perhaps more that we don't suffer both the pain and the dread of leaving our loved ones. That, in a sense, is natural. It doesn't mean that we are not apprehensive and perhaps fearful. But it does mean that we, as Christians, as human beings, are asked to believe that through death, the promise of life that Jesus gives, our lives transformed through death go on. And so I matter in my living, and very much so I matter in my dying. And that's our task as disciples, to give hope and love to those around us, in particular, to give it to those who have been perhaps been given a terminal diagnosis. And to do that, we have to be able to acknowledge our own fears of dying and death and to integrate them into our faith. We need to listen, to truly listen to the person we are caring for. It may be that what is needed is reassurance that pain will be bearable and not a false promise of a cure or that death will not happen. It may be for all family and friends to be concerned and offer what help they can. It may be to pray. Sometimes it may even be, even be to stand back and simply make people aware of your support because there can be a crowd. So one of the interesting things I find is that the, some people say my friends have disappeared, other, others say it's just too much. It may be to stand back, it may be to support the carers. I think it's a bit like saying that it takes a village, you know, it's a bit that saying it, used to be a, it takes a village uh, to bring up a child. I forget who said that, 
I think it may also take a village to help us to die. In a way, that's what a hospice is, a kind of village, a community helping people. And in that sense, our families, and hopefully our parishes in some way, are also villages of support. We pray, perhaps we give material, financial support, but particularly through lived faith, we help the dying person feel whole in the midst of frailty and pain. We learn to try and find out what we as a society need to provide. We know that resources are scarce. There aren't always enough places. Perhaps we need to talk to our politicians about providing more hospice-like care in our nursing homes when things are so short. A friend of mine some years ago, when asked how she was coping with a terminal diagnosis, replied, I had one day of birth and celebrated that every year as my birthday. I was born into the unknown and had to live my life discovering how I was to live and love in this life. Now I'm approaching another day of birth. I am approaching the sense of death, but not the end, another day of discovery of going into the unknown. And she approached and entered that day of hope in hope and in love, sustained by her husband and daughters and by her many friends. And I think that's so important for us, isn't it, to have a meaning, to having a loving community around us who understand just a little of how we are feeling. And I think that's one of the important insights of any good care especially of the spirituality of the hospice. The individual is important in her or his dying and in their death. They need people around them who are both compassionate and skilled to offer practical help while acknowledging fear and encouraging hope. And for those who want to be reassured in faith by the chaplain there, and by also by the very practical lived faith of many of the staff. And that's Jesus in the Last Supper. He knows the fear of the disciples, but gives them hope in him and in his Father. And so we've walked, and are walking the way of the cross with Jesus. We walk it with one another. We walk it with those who are dying. And we let them walk in our lives as well. And in doing this, we bear the fruit of the cross, the tree of life. That this promises to those who live their lives sacrificially for others. This destiny, this great glorious bursting forth of love. So at the end of these stations of the cross, we walk the way of the cross we walk the way of life. Let's just take a moment to ask God's blessing on us to give us insight as to where we might be called this evening to be sensitive to a need of somebody we perhaps were hardly aware of, even close to us, who's now beginning to suffer and be ready to be that Jesus Christ of the Last Supper, being aware of the fear of his disciples but reassuring them with his love. May, also, and may Almighty God bless us and keep us in the peace and hope of the Lord. We pray especially for those in the hospices in this archdiocese, I don't know them all, but Strathcarran, the Victoria Hospital in St. Ward 16 and Queen Margaret, used to be a hospice ward, and pray for the many other hospices that are around carrying out the work of Christ in his care for those who are frail, in need, afraid, but yet willing to seek faith. And may Almighty God bless and keep us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I'll hand you back to Paul. Thank you, Father Jerry. Uh, that was wonderful to have your experience and what a great thing our hospice movement 
is. Um, so everyone, thank you for joining us uh, on this journey over the last few weeks. Um, I hope you found it a useful preparation um, for Easter and wish you a very uh, joyous Holy Week. Our next prayer events for, from the Pro-Life Office is on the 23rd of April, just before the Pro-Life Chain that you may have been to before, but that is at um, the Sacred Heart Parish uh, Lauriston in Edinburgh. It's at 10 o'clock in the morning and Archbishop Cushley will be leading us in the Rosary. If you can come along to that, you can register or in fact, you can just show up. You don't need to register. So be lovely to see you uh, in person. But for now, thank you for this Easter journey together and wishing you a very happy and holy Easter week. Goodbye now. Thank you.